And runtime services allow us to interact with variables. So if anyone's familiar with uh, open firmware implementation, they'll, be, um, they'll probably know about the um, variables stored in MVRAM. Uh, I'll talk more about those in EFI later. Um, it, it, runtime services also expose time services and some virtual memory services. Next definition is the framework, which is Intel's reference implementation. And this appears to be what Apple have chosen to use. Um, interestingly, it's partially open source as Tiano. So I recommend um, anyone that's interested um, visiting tianocore.org and uh, downloading it. And uh, I found this in one of the specs that, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, Intel views the framework as their implementation of choice. Let's talk about EFI and security. EFI 1.10 spec is not essentially focused on security. Um, the framework spec, remember the framework's the implementation, they do elaborate on um, the security phase. But uh, simply looking at the EFI 1.10 spec, it's not so clear um, the, the role that security plays. The security phase, the SEC phase, is, um, should be the first phase in the framework. So essentially, when you power on your machine, that's the very first um, phase we enter. It's responsible for handling platform um, restarts. It's also responsible for um, creating a temporary memory store when we've turned the system on, uh, we may not be able to, we're likely not able to access RAM at that point because we haven't configured the North Bridge. So um, it's up to the SEC phase to actually provide a, a small memory store, typically by using the processor cache. It also serves as a route of trust in the system. Um, this is important from a security perspective. If you're going to create a, a route of trust, you have to do it as early as possible, obviously. Um, and so it's typically done in the SEC phase. And the SEC phase hand, hands off to the PEI, which is the pre-EFI phase. Um, the pre-EFI phase is responsible for loading um, low-level low level hardware drivers, essentially. So typically, um, drivers for the chipset. Um, of course, all phases must maintain the root of trust. And the key objective of the uh, um, pre-FI phase is to get you to the point that you can then load the driver execution environment, and then we can start loading the interesting drivers, the drivers that actually talk to devices on the bus. So this is kind of what it looks like uh, with the various phases. This is taken from um, Intel's framework documentation. We can see that we have the security phase, followed by uh, pre-FI driver execution. Um, and we get to the point of uh, loading uh, bootloader, and then we um, exit the boot services, and so the APIs, the, the, the functions available from the uh, DXE phase are no longer available, um, but the runtime, um, runtime services are. So onto the interesting stuff, how can we abuse EFI? Basically, the first objective is get code into the EFI environment. A few different ways we can do this, and these range from the easy to the um, more tricky. We can simply modify the bootloader itself. Bootloader, uh, file on disk, we can simply patch it. We can, um, slightly more stealthy, we can modify the NVRAM bootloader variable as in the variable stored in uh, non-volatile memory that basically says, what bootloader should I start? Or what boot manager sh should I start? We can actually target the platform firmware itself and patch the core EFI framework. Or we can go for a code injection attack. And these are gonna be important when we have an environment that enforces signed drivers. So essentially, by implementation flaw, I mean we look for something like a buffer overflow to get our code in there. That's our first objective, simply getting code into the environment. Next, we have to actually subvert the operating system somehow. So an easy way to do this is we can shim a, a boot service or a runtime service so that when the bootloader calls that boot service or runtime service, it executes our code. And the bootloader is responsible for loading the kernel. So if we pick, if we pick a good boot service to, to shim or a good runtime service, then the kernel will already be loaded and we can simply patch it. Uh, 
we can modify the ACP tables, very similar to the attack against legacy BIOS. We can, although in, in that instance, the ACP tables will be in physical memory at that point. We can load a driver into system management mode. This is one of the more interesting areas of uh, EFI and uh, rootkits. I'll discuss that in detail shortly. Finally, if um, the EFI environment is about to load a compatibility support module, as in it's going to actually load a legacy bootloader, for example, uh, bootcamp loading Windows, then uh, we can carry out attacks um, more, more similar to um, traditional BIOS attacks. So, go through these quickly. Modifying the bootloader binary itself. Um, OSX uh, doesn't actually use the EFI system partition. It's on the main uh, HFS plus partition. And it's simply boot.efi at that path. So, um, we can simply uh, patch that file. Um, Apple's implementation doesn't verify driver signing. Uh, doesn't verify um, signing of EFI applications. This isn't really very stealthy. Um, ultimately, we're just patching a file on disk. If you have anything like Tripwire, any um, operating system integrity tools, then they'll flag it unless uh, the rootkits uh, already thought of this in advance. Really, if we're just modifying a file on disk, why don't we just patch the kernel? Um, and this won't work in environments where we have um, driver signing. Modifying MVRAM variables, so we have the concept of these global variables that are persisted in non-volatile RAM, and they specify which bootloader we should execute. EFI provides an interface for reading and writing variables. Uh, the operating system also provides a tool for um, doing this. So we can create our own bootloader, and we can simply modify a variable in the MVRAM and say, use our bootloader instead of boot.efi. Um, typically, what we want to do in our bootloader is um, we, can, we can either uh, patch the environment somehow, um, we can either insert a shim and then call the original bootloader, um, and actually the, the variable name we'd need to do this is the uh, EFI boot device variable. Is this stealthier than just modifying the original bootloader? Um, probably not. It, leaves, it does leave the original bootloader intact, but we've now modified uh, NVRAM, and that's pretty obvious if you're carrying out forensics. Again, it won't work if, we, if the environment enforces driver signing. Code injection attacks. This, these will be useful when we do have an environment that enforces driver signing. Ultimately, we're looking for an implementation flaw in the driver, a traditional security flaw like a stack overflow or a heap overflow. One thing I haven't mentioned is that the uh, EFI environment is um, protected mode with a, a flat memory model which, uh, with no paging. So exploiting drivers is, is um, fairly easy, uh, assuming you have a flaw in the first instance. And you might say, well, where would we look for, for an overflow? Well, there's plenty of targets, really. Anything that passes data that we can modify as a target. So we have file systems, so we could uh, that should just be fat, but we could uh, modify the uh, file system structure somehow and uh, attempt to cause uh, some sort of implementation flaw in the driver. We can target the um, P passing code. Any code for um, verifying the P files is a great target. So any data in certificates, um, ASM1 decoding, for example, and any data that's received over the network. How might we shim a boot service? I said this was uh, one of the, once we have code executing, this is one of the um, easy ways to subvert the bootloader. Well, the bootlo bootloader must um, signal to the EFI environment that it's exiting, exiting boot services. It's exiting the EFI environment and it's about to transfer control to the kernel. It does this by just calling exit boot services. Um, so it's the perfect place to hook because the kernel is already loaded. So we simply just need to um, patch the kernel. Creating a driver that does the shim is actually very easy. Uh, we can get the function pointer for the exit boot services function from the EFI system table. Um, I looked at shimming runtime services, but um, I didn't actually find many of them that were called. So um, I think 
I think that may be uh, common in future that the bootloader relies more on runtime services, but ultimately things like eLilo and Grub for booting Linux on, say, a MacBook, um, they will simply uh, load the kernel and then, in fact, I have it on the next slide, they will uh, load the kernel, um, free whatever resources they need to for the EFI environment, um, they will um, terminate boot services and then just start the kernel. So um, you can imagine in, in step three that if we've um, hooked exit boot services or executing our own code, at this point the kernel's loaded, it's trivial for us to patch it. Okay, another attack we can carry out is um, exploiting system management mode. This, in my opinion, is one of the most interesting features of EFI. So system management mode was uh, first introduced in the 386 SL. Um, if I take the, the bottom point before the top one, actually. Um, ultimately, I, I think of it as a get-out-of-jail-free card for um, platform designers. Um, ultimately, it allows us to um, execute code opaque to the operating system. So the operating system is simply not aware of it. So you guys are probably familiar with um, virtualization attacks and virtualization rootkits. You can think of SMM in, in a similar way. We're able to execute code that the operating system um, typically cannot see. Um, it can probably detect that there's, um, it, it's lost some, some time between executing two instructions, um, just like virtualization rootkits can be uh, detected. But uh, here are some common uses for SMM. Um, so ACP, we, we typically use it for um, handling ACP and things like power buttons on your notebook. It's good for error logging. If, for example, um, we need to, uh, for example, uh, there's some memory, problems with your memory, we can simply, uh, th those can trigger an SMI, an S system management mode interrupt. We can log them. Um, any kind of workaround, essentially, gets um, put in SMM, workaround for hardware. And we can get into SMM a number of ways. We can do that via uh, generating a system management interrupt. So we can do that ourselves from the operating system. We can set it up to be periodically fired, uh, maybe triggered by an external event, for example, plugging in some hardware. Um, and the final, uh, well, actually, there are many ways, but one of the interesting ways we can also get in is via an IO access. So we can basically set up the chipset to trap to SMM when it uh, does a certain IO access read or write. How can SMM be abused? Well, um, last year at CANSEC, there was a talk that used SMM to bypass BSD secure levels. And I recommend this for anyone interested in SMM. Um, the paper hinted at the possibility of SMM-based malware, but didn't explore that idea. So what does SMM give for a rootkit or for a rootkit detector software? There's some interesting points. Hardware breakpoints do not fire in system management mode. So if we have any kind of detection software that's trying to detect us with hardware breakpoints, they don't fire. The operating system cannot access um, SMM RAM if a lock bit is set in the chipset. So SMM RAM is simply um, some, some memory in your, it's obviously some physical memory. Uh, basically, it, it's often stored uh, in the memory hole created by the uh, video memory. So your uh, video card basically uh, has some memory and uh, the, the memory controller redirects access to that memory range to the card, leaving a hole in physical memory, and that's where system management code is stored. Um, once we've set that lock bit, typically um, in the BIOS or in EFI, then the operating system um, cannot gain access to system management RAM. SMIs 